in glancing over the somewhat incoherent series of memoirs with which I have endeavoured to illustrate a few of the mental peculiarities of my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I have been struck by the difficulty which I have experienced in picking out examples which shall in every way answer my purpose. For in those cases in which Holmes has performed some tour de force of analytical reasoning and has demonstrated the value of his peculiar methods of investigation, the facts themselves have often been so slight or so commonplace that I could not feel justified in laying them before the public. On the other hand, it has frequently happened that he has been concerned in some research where the facts have been of the most remarkable and dramatic character, but where the share which he has himself taken in determining their causes has been less pronounced than I as his biographer could wish. The small matter which I have chronicled under the heading of A Study in Scarlet, and that other later one connected with the loss of the Gloria Scott, may serve as examples of this Scylla and Charybdis, which are forever threatening the historian. It may be that in the business of which I am now about to write, the part which my friend played is not sufficiently accentuated, and yet the whole train of circumstances is so remarkable that I cannot bring myself to omit it entirely from this series. I cannot be sure of the exact date, for some of my memoranda upon the matter have been mislaid, but it must have been towards the end of the first year during which Holmes and I shared chambers in Baker Street. It was boisterous October weather, and we had both remained indoors all day, I because I feared with my shaken health to face the keen autumn wind, while he was deep in some of those abstruse chemical investigations which absorbed him utterly as long as he was engaged upon them. Towards evening, however, the breaking of a test tube brought his research to a premature ending, and he sprang up from his chair with an exclamation of impatience and a clouded brow. "'A day's work ruined, Watson,' said he, striding across to the window. "'Ha! Huh, the stars are out and the wind has fallen. What do you say to a ramble through London?' I was weary of our little sitting-room and gladly acquiesced. For three hours we strolled about together, watching the ever-changing kaleidoscope of life as it ebbs and flows through Fleet Street and the Strand. Holmes had shaken off his temporary ill-humour, and his characteristic talk, with its keen observance of detail and subtle power of inference, held me amused and enthralled. It was ten o'clock before we reached Baker Street again. A brougham was waiting at our door. Hum, a doctor's. General practitioner, I perceive, said Holmes. Not been long in practice, but has had a good deal to do. Come to consult us, I fancy. Lucky we came back. I was sufficiently conversant with Holmes's methods to be able to follow his reasoning, and to see that the nature and state of the various medical instruments in the wicker basket which hung in the lamplight inside the brougham had given him the data for his swift deduction. The light in our window above showed that this late visit was indeed intended for us. With some curiosity as to what could have sent a brother medico to us at such an hour, I followed Holmes into our sanctum. A pale, taper-faced man with sandy whiskers rose up from a chair by the fire as we entered. His age may not have been more than three or four and thirty, but his haggard expression, an unhealthy hue, told of a life which has sapped his strength and robbed him of his youth. His manner was nervous and shy, like that of a sensitive gentleman, and the thin white hand which he laid on the mantelpiece as he rose was that of an artist rather than of a surgeon. His dress was quiet and sombre. A black frock coat, dark trousers, and a touch of colour about his necktie. "'Good evening, doctor,' said Holmes cheerily. I'm glad to see that you have only been waiting a very few minutes. You spoke to my coachman, then? No, it was the candle on the side table that told me. Pray resume your seat and let me know how I can serve you. My name is Dr. Percy Trevelyan, said our visitor, and I live at 403 Brook Street. Are you not the author of a monograph upon obscure nervous lesions? I asked. His pale cheeks flushed with pleasure at hearing that his work was known to me. I so seldom hear of the work that I thought it was quite dead, said he. My publishers gave me a most discouraging account of its sale. 
You are yourself, I presume, a medical man, a retired army surgeon. My own hobby has always been nervous disease. I should wish to make it an absolute specialty, but of course a man must take what he can get at first. This, however, is beside the question, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and I quite appreciate how valuable your time is. The fact is that a very singular train of events has occurred recently at my house in Brook Street, and tonight they came to such a head that I felt it was quite impossible for me to wait another hour before asking for your advice and assistance. Sherlock Holmes sat down and lit his pipe. You are very welcome to both, said he. Pray let me have a detailed account of what the circumstances are which have disturbed you. One or two of them are so trivial, said Dr. Trevelyan, that really I am almost ashamed to mention them. But the matter is so inexplicable, and the recent turn which it has taken is so elaborate, that I shall lay it all before you, and you shall judge what is essential and what is not. I am compelled, to begin with, to say something of my own college career. I'm a London University man, you know, and I'm sure that you will not think that I am unduly singing my own praises if I say that my student career was considered by my professors to be a very promising one. After I had graduated, I continued to devote myself to research, occupying a minor position in King's College Hospital, and I was fortunate enough to excite considerable interest by my research into the pathology of catalepsy, and finally to win the Bruce Pinkerton Prize and Medal by the monograph on nervous lesions, to which your friend has just alluded. I should not go too far if I were to say that there was a general impression at that time that a distinguished career lay before me. But the one great stumbling block lay in my want of capital. As you will readily understand, a specialist who aims high is compelled to start in one of a dozen streets in the Cavendish Square quarter, all of which entail enormous rents and furnishing expenses. Besides this preliminary outlay, he must be prepared to keep himself for some years and to hire a presentable carriage and horse. To do this was quite beyond my power, and I could only hope that by economy I might in ten years' time save enough to enable me to put up my plate. Suddenly, however, an unexpected incident opened up quite a new prospect to me. This was a visit from a gentleman of the name of Blessington, who was a complete stranger to me. He came up to my room one morning and plunged into business in an instant. You are the same Percy Trevelyan who has had so distinguished a career and won a great prize lately, said he. I bowed. Answer me frankly, he continued, for you will find it to your interest to do so. You have all the cleverness which makes a successful man. Have you the tact? I could not help smiling at the abruptness of the question. I trust that I have my share, I said. Any bad habits? Not drawn towards drink, eh? Really, sir, I cried. Quite right, that's all right, but I was bound to ask. With all these qualities, why are you not in practice? I shrugged my shoulders. Come, come, said he in his bustling way. It's the old story, more in your brains than in your pocket, eh? What would you say if I were to start you in Brook Street? I stared at him in astonishment. Oh, it's for my sake, not for yours, he cried. I'll be perfectly frank with you, and if it suits you, it will suit me very well. I have a few thousands to invest, do you see, and I think I'll sink them in you. <laughs> but why? I gasped. Well, it's just like any other speculation and safer than most. What am I to do, then? I'll tell you. I'll take the house, furnish it, pay the maids, and run the whole place. All you have to do is just to wear out your chair in the consulting room. I'll let you have pocket money and everything. Then you hand over to me three quarters of what you earn, and you keep the other quarter for yourself. This was the strange proposal, Mr. Holmes, with which the man Blessington approached me. I won't weary you with the account of how we bargained and negotiated. It ended in my moving into the house next Lady Day and starting in practice on very much the same conditions as he had suggested. He came himself to live with me in the character of a resident patient. His heart was weak, it appears, and he needed constant medical supervision. He turned the two best rooms of the first floor into a sitting room and bedroom for himself. He was a man of singular habits shunning company, and very seldom going out. His life was irregular, but in one respect he was regularity itself. 
Every evening at the same hour, he walked into the consulting room, examined the books, put down five and three pence for every guinea that I had earned, and carried the rest off to the strong box in his own room. I may say with confidence that he never had occasion to regret his speculation. From the first it was a success. A few good cases and the reputation which I had won in the hospital brought me rapidly to the front, and during the last few years I have made him a rich man. So much, Mr. Holmes, for my past history and my relations with Mr. Blessington. It only remains for me now to tell you what has occurred to bring me here tonight. Some weeks ago, Mr. Blessington came down to me in, as it seemed to me, a state of considerable agitation. He spoke of some burglary which, he said, had been committed in the West End, and he appeared, I remember, to be quite unnecessarily excited about it, declaring that a day should not pass before we should add stronger bolts to our windows and doors. For a week he continued to be in a peculiar state of restlessness, peering continually out of the windows, and ceasing to take the short walk which had usually been the prelude to his dinner. From his manner it struck me that he was in mortal dread of something or somebody, but when I questioned him upon the point he became so offensive that I was compelled to drop the subject. Gradually, as time passed, his fears appeared to die away, and he had renewed his former habits, when a fresh event reduced him to the pitiable state of prostration in which he now lies. What happened was this. Two days ago I received the letter which I now read to you. Neither address nor date is attached to it. A Russian nobleman who is now resident in England, it runs, would be glad to avail himself of the professional assistance of Dr. Percy Trevelyan. He has been for some years a victim to cataleptic attacks, on which, as is well known, Dr. Trevelyan is an authority. He proposes to call at about quarter past six tomorrow evening, if Dr. Trevelyan will make it convenient to be at home. This letter interested me deeply, because the chief difficulty in the study of catalepsy is the rareness of the disease. You may believe then that I was in my consulting room when, at the appointed hour, the page showed in the patient. He was an elderly man, thin, demure, and commonplace, by no means the conception one forms of a Russian nobleman. I was much more struck by the appearance of his companion. This was a tall young man, surprisingly handsome, with a dark, fierce face and the limbs and chest of a Hercules. He had his hand under the other's arm as they entered and helped him to a chair with a tenderness which one would hardly have expected from his appearance. You will excuse my coming in, doctor, said he to me, speaking English with a slight lisp. This is my father, and his health is a matter of the most overwhelming importance to me. I was touched by his filial anxiety, you would perhaps care to remain during the consultation, said I. Not for the world, he cried with a gesture of horror. It is more painful to me than I can express. If I were to see my father in one of these dreadful seizures, I am convinced that I should never survive it. My own nervous system is an exceptionally sensitive one. With your permission, I will remain in the waiting room while you go into my father's case. To this, of course, I assented, and the young man withdrew. The patient and I then plunged into a discussion of his case, of which I took exhaustive notes. He was not remarkable for intelligence, and his answers were frequently obscure, which I attributed to his limited acquaintance with our language. Suddenly, however, as I sat writing, he ceased to give any answer at all to my inquiries, and on my turning towards him I was shocked to see that he was sitting bolt upright in his chair, staring at me with a perfectly blank and rigid face he was again in the grip of his mysterious malady. My first feeling, as I have just said, was one of pity and horror. My second, I fear, was rather one of professional satisfaction. I made notes of my patient's pulse and temperature, tested the rigidity of his muscles, and examined his reflexes. There was nothing markedly abnormal in any of these conditions, which harmonized with my former experiences. I had obtained good results in such cases by the inhalation of nitrite of amyl, and the presence seemed an admirable opportunity of testing its virtues. The bottle was downstairs in my laboratory, so leaving my patient seated in his chair, 
I ran down to get it. There was some little delay in finding it, five minutes, let us say, and then I returned. Imagine my amazement to find the room empty and the patient gone. Of course, my first act was to run into the waiting room. The sun had gone also. The hall door had been closed but not shut. My page, who admits patience, is a new boy and by no means quick. He waits downstairs and runs up to show patients out when I ring the consulting room bell. He had heard nothing, and the affair remained a complete mystery. Mr. Blessington came in from his walk shortly afterwards, but I did not say anything to him upon the subject, for, to tell the truth, I have got in the way of late of holding as little communication with him as possible. Well, I never thought that I should see anything more of the Russian and his son, so you can imagine my amazement when at the very same hour this evening they both came marching into my consulting room just as they had done before. I feel that I owe you a great many apologies for my abrupt departure yesterday, doctor, said my patient. I confess that I was very much surprised at it, said I. Well, the fact is, he remarked, that when I recover from these attacks, my mind is always very clouded as to all that has gone before. I woke up in a strange room, as it seemed to me, and made my way out into the street in a sort of dazed way when you were absent. And I, said the son, seeing my father pass the door of the waiting room, naturally thought that the consultation had come to an end. It was not until we had reached home that I began to realize the true state of affairs. Well, said I, laughing, there's no harm done except that you puzzled me terribly. So if you, sir, would kindly step into the sitting room, I shall be happy to continue our consultation, which was brought to so abrupt an ending. For half an hour or so I discussed that old gentleman's symptoms with him, and then, having prescribed for him, I saw him go off upon the arm of his son. I have told you that Mr. Blessington generally chose this hour of the day for his exercise. He came in shortly afterwards and passed upstairs. An instant later I heard him running down, and he burst into my consulting room like a man who is mad with panic. Who has been in my room? he cried. No one, said I. It's a lie, he yelled. Come up and look. I passed over the grossness of his language as he seemed half out of his mind with fear. When I went upstairs with him, he pointed to several footprints upon the light carpet. Do you mean to say those are mine? he cried. They were certainly very much larger than any which he could have made, and were evidently quite fresh. It rained hard this afternoon, as you know, and my patients were the only people who called. It must have been the case, then, that the man in the waiting room had, for some unknown reason, while I was busy with the other, ascended to the room of my resident patient. Nothing had been touched or taken, but there were the footprints to prove that the intrusion was an undoubted fact. Mr. Blessington seemed more excited over the matter than I should have thought possible, though of course it was enough to disturb anybody's peace of mind. He actually sat crying in an armchair, and I could hardly get him to speak coherently. It was his suggestion that I should come round to you, and of course I at once saw the propriety of it, for certainly the incident is a very singular one, though he appears to completely overrate its importance. If you would only come back with me in my brougham, you would at least be able to soothe him, though I can hardly hope that you will be able to explain this remarkable occurrence. Sherlock Holmes had listened to this long narrative with an intentness which showed me that his interest was keenly aroused. His face was as impassive as ever, but his lids had drooped more heavily over his eyes, and his smoke had curled up more thickly from his pipe to emphasize each curious episode in the doctor's tale. As our visitor concluded, Holmes sprang up without a word, handed me my hat, picked his own from the table, and followed Dr. Trevelyan to the door. Within a quarter of an hour, we had been dropped at the door of the physician's residence in Brook Street, one of those somber, flat-faced houses which one associates with a West End practice. A small page admitted us, and we began at once to ascend the broad, well-carpeted stair. But a singular interruption brought us to a standstill. The light at the top was suddenly whisked out, and from the darkness came a reedy, quivering voice. I have a pistol, it cried. I give you my word that I'll fire if you come any nearer. 
This really grows outrageous, Mr. Blessington, cried Dr. Trevelyan. Oh, then it's you, Doctor, said the voice with a great heave of relief. But those other gentlemen, are they what they pretend to be? We were conscious of a long scrutiny out of the darkness. Yes, yes, it's all right, said the voice at last. You can come up, and I'm sorry if my precautions have annoyed you. He relit the stair gas as he spoke, and we saw before us a singular-looking man, whose appearance as well as his voice testified to his jangled nerves. He was very fat, but had apparently at some time been much fatter, so that the skin hung about his face in loose pouches, like the cheeks of a bloodhound. He was of a sickly color, and his thin, sandy hair seemed to bristle up with the intensity of his emotion. In his hand he held a pistol, but he thrust it into his pocket as we advanced. "'Good evening, Mr. Holmes,' said he. "'I am sure that I am very much obliged to you for coming round. No one ever needed your advice more than I do. I suppose that Dr. Trevelyan has told you of this most unwarrantable intrusion into my rooms?' "'Quite so,' said Holmes. "'Who are these two men, Mr. Blessington, and why do they wish to molest you?' "'Well, well,' said the resident patient in a nervous fashion. Of course it is hard to say that. You can hardly expect me to answer that, Mr. Holmes. Do you mean to say that you don't know? Come in here, if you please. Just have the kindness to step in here. He led the way into his bedroom, which was large and comfortably furnished. You see that? said he, pointing to a big black box at the end of his bed. I have never been a very rich man, Mr. Holmes. Never made but one investment in my life, as Dr. Trevelyan would tell you. But I don't believe in bankers. I would never trust a banker, Mr. Holmes. Between ourselves, what little I have is in that box. So you can understand what it means to me when unknown people force themselves into my rooms. Holmes looked at Blessington in his questioning way and shook his head. I cannot possibly advise you if you try to deceive me, said he. But I've told you everything. Holmes turned on his heel with a gesture of disgust. Good night, Dr. Trevelyan, said he. And no advice for me, cried Blessington in a breaking voice. My advice to you, sir, is to speak the truth. A minute later we were in the street and walking for home. We had crossed Oxford Street and were halfway down Harley Street before I could get a word from my companion. Sorry to bring you out on such a fool's errand, Watson, he said at last. It is an interesting case, too, at the bottom of it. I can make little of it, I confessed. Well, it is quite evident that there are two men, more perhaps, but at least two, who are determined for some reason to get at this fellow Blessington. I have no doubt in my mind that both on the first and on the second occasion that young man penetrated to Blessington's room while his confederate, by an ingenious device, kept the doctor from interfering. And the catalepsy? A fraudulent imitation, Watson though I should hardly dare to hint as much to our specialist. It is a very easy complaint to imitate. I have done it myself. And then? By the purest chance, Blessington was out on each occasion. Their reason for choosing so unusual an hour for a consultation was obviously to ensure that there should be no other patient in the waiting room. It just happened, however, that this hour coincided with Blessington's constitutional which seems to show that they were not very well acquainted with his daily routine. Of course, if they had been merely off to plunder, they would at least have made some attempt to search for it. Besides, I can read in a man's eye when it is his own skin that he is frightened for. It is inconceivable that this fellow could have made two such vindictive enemies as these appear to be without knowing of it. I hold it, therefore, to be certain that he does know who these men are, and that for reasons of his own, he suppresses it. It is just possible that tomorrow may find him in a more communicative mood. Is there not one alternative, I suggested, grotesquely improbable, no doubt, but still just conceivable? Might the whole story of the cataleptic Russian and his son be a concoction of Dr. Trevelyan's, who has, for his own purposes, been in Blessington's rooms? I saw in the gaslight that Holmes wore an amused smile at this brilliant departure of mine. My dear fellow, said he, it was one of the first solutions which occurred to me, but I was soon able to corroborate the doctor's tale. 
This young man has left prints upon the stair carpet which made it quite superfluous for me to ask to see those which he had made in the room. When I tell you that his shoes were square-toed instead of being pointed like Blessington's, and were quite an inch and a third longer than the doctor's, you will acknowledge that there can be no doubt as to his individuality. But we may sleep on it for now, for I shall be surprised if we do not hear something further from Brook Street in the morning.'